and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're all doing okay. Thank you for coming back to my channel. Now, in today's video, I want to talk about Ruth Ellis. Now, she was the last woman to be hanged in the UK back in 1955. And there was a lot of controversy around this. And I'm gonna explain a bit about Ruth and the murder and then the trial. So different things really. I did do a mini series on serial killers just under a year ago. I know I said in a previous video it was over a year ago, but it was actually under a year ago. So not that that really matters. But yeah, so here I am back doing a about a murderer, not necessarily a serial killer, but if you're interested in hearing about Ruth Ellis and why it's a controversy then please do keep watching. Ruth Ellis was born on the 9th of October 1926 in Rill, Wales, and she was the fifth of six children. Her father had often worked away, I think he was a musician, but when he was home, he was often abusive and cruel to the children. And I know that these siblings would try and protect one another, especially the older ones protecting the younger ones. So even from a young start, men were not treating Ruth very well. And during her childhood, the family had moved to base in Stoke in Hampshire. She went to an old girls school, which she left when she was 14, to work as a waitress. And then in 1941, when London was prospering, he decided to move to London. More opportunities for the family. In 1944, 70 year old Ruth had met a Canadian soldier and she became pregnant to him. He was called Claire and she named her son Claire Andrea, but they called a son Andy the shop and then for the first year of his life he would support Ruth and the baby you know with money but then at a year old he decided he wanted to go live back in Canada with his family so he wrote Ruth a letter and Ruth and the baby never saw him again. Now the soldier was married as you can see he went back on to live with his family again. Ruth became a nightclub hostess and she started doing nude modelling work. And this paid significantly more than her factory and clerical jobs that she had got since leaving school. So she obviously had various different jobs, giving them a go, trying to make ends meet really for herself and then when she had a baby. Maurice Conley, who is the manager of the court club, had started to blackmail his employees into forcing them to sleep with him and turn them all into prostitutes. So by early 1950, she was making money as a prostitute and she became pregnant again by one of her regular clients. She did have an abortion, but back in 1950 it was still illegal, so I presume it was like a back street kind of abortion. And then soon as she had the abortion, at three months gone, she went back to work as soon as she could. On the 8th of November 1950, Ruth had met 41-year-old dentist George Johnston Ellis and he had two sons and he'd been a customer at the court club and he was often violent, he was an alcoholic, he was possessive and he was a jealous type. The marriage deteriorated quite rapidly and he was just convinced that she was having affairs but it's probably the fact that she was still working as a prostitute and a hostess. He obviously didn't like what she did. She did leave him several times, but always went back to him. In 1951, 
Ruth did appear uncredited in the film Lady Godiva's Ride Again. Come on, Abby, I'll get back on the line. Uh, where's Daphne? She went back to the dressing room to fetch her lipstick. Charlie, go up to the dressing room and fetch Daphne. Oh, I'd rather run a troop of girl guides. Followed by a little girl from High Wycombe, Felicity Unsworth. The soft furnishing manufacturer's ideal upholstery girl. And she was appearing as a walk-on beauty queen. And this was the days before she dyed her hair blonde. And she was actually four months pregnant during this time. Ruth later gave birth to a daughter called Georgina, but George refused to acknowledge paternity for the baby. And they were separated shortly afterwards and then later divorced. So Ruth and her two children had moved back to home with her parents to live and she did go back to prostitute to make ends meet. In 1953, Ruth became the manager of the Little Club, which was a nightclub in Knightsbridge. And here she was lavished with expensive gifts by her admirers and had a number of celebrity friends. And this is where she met David Blakely. She met him through Mike Hawthorne. He was a Formula One champion. He won, he won many races and he was really successful during his short career because sadly he died at a young age. David Blakely was a racer just like Mike Hawthorne and he was three year junior. David Blakely was a well-mannered former public school boy he was educated at Shrewsbury and Sandhurst, also he was a hard drinker as well. Within weeks he moved into a flat which was located above the club despite being engaged to another woman and she was called Mary Dawson and Ruth became pregnant for the fourth time to David Blakely but had an abortion due to the way this worship was and he was seeing other women therefore she decided to start dating D Desmond Cousin he's been an RAF pilot who'd flown the Lancaster bombings during World War II when Ruth was sacked as the manager of the club she moved in with Desmond Cousin which was in north of Oxford Street however she was still seeing David Blakely and it became increasingly violent and bitter and they were both still seeing other people. Blakely did offer to marry Ruth and she did agree but in January 1955 she was pregnant again but sadly she miscarried this baby as she was punched in the stomach by David Blakely during one of the many arguments that they would have. On Easter Sunday, 10th of April, 1955, Ruth took a taxi from Cousin's home to a second floor flat at 29 Cancer Road, where she suspected David Blakely to be. And this was the home of Anthony and Carol Finglater. Now, when she arrived, he sped off in his car so she paid the taxi and got out and walked a quarter of a mile. She walked her way to the Magdala pub, which is a large public house. And it's still standing today, although I'm not sure it's open now. And here she found Blakely's car parked outside. At around 9.30pm, David Blakely and his friend Clive Gunnell emerged from outside the pub. And they walked past Ruth who was standing in a doorway of a new stages near the Magdala. She he didn't see her, neither of them did, possibly because they were drunk. And she said, hello, David. And then she shouted, David. As Blakely searched for his keys to the car, Ruth took out a .38 calibre Smith & Weston Victory model revolver from her handbag and fired five shots at him. Five. The first shot missed and he started to run. Pursued by Ruth around the car, she fired a second shot 
which caused him to collapse onto the pavement. She then stood over him and fired three more shots. One bullet was fired less than half an inch from his back and left powder burns on his skin. Ruth was seen by witnesses that she was stood over by a as she repeatedly tried to shoot the sixth shot in the revolver and it finally fired into the ground which the bullet ricocheted, hit the wall and there's three bullet holes in the wall of the Magdala which is still there today and it hit a bystander and injured Ruth was in apparent shock and she'd asked Clive Goodall to call the police and she was arrested immediately by a police officer and he was off duty. He was actually drinking in the Magdala at the time of the shooting. So he heard and this policeman had heard to say, I'm guilty, I'm a little confused. Blakely's body was taken to hospital and he was still a, a, alive in the ambulance and he had multiple bullet wounds to the intestines, liver, lung, aorta and trachea. But by the time he got to the hospital, he was pronounced dead. At Hampstead Police Station, Ruth appeared to be calm and not under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And she made a detailed confession and straight away she was charged with murder. And she made her first appearance at the Magistrates Court on 11th of April 1955 and was ordered to be held on remand. So it was all happening really quickly. And she was twice examined by principal medical officer M.R. Perry Williams who failed to find evidence of mental illness and this because I cannot say it I've tried to say it a hundred times and I just can't say it <laughs> so one of these was examined on the 3rd of May but found no abnormality while on remand she was examined by psychiatrist Dr. D. Whitaker for the defence and Dr. A. Danzel for the, which is on behalf of the Home Office and now they found evidence of insanity. On June 20th, 1955, Ruth appeared in court one at the Old Bailey before Mr. Justice Havers. She was dressed in a black suit and white silk blouse and she had freshly bleached and dyed hair, with dyed blonde hair, as we all know her as. And her defence in counsel, Aubrey Melford Stevenson, supported by C. Bag Shaw and Peter Rollinson, expressed concern about her appearance, you know, with her dyed blonde hair. But she did not appear to change anything. She didn't want it to appear less striking. She just wanted to be herself. The only question put to Ruth by by the prosecutor Christmas Humphreys was when you fired the revolver at close range into the body of David Blakely what did you intend to do? Her answer was it's obvious when I shot him I intended to kill him. This reply guaranteed a guilty verdict and the mandatory death sentence and the jury only took 20 minutes to convict her. Ruth remained at Holloway Prison while awaiting execution. She told her mother that she did not want a petition to reprieve her from the death sentence and took no part in the campaign. But at her relative's urging, her solicitor, John Bickford, wrote a seven-page letter to the Home Secretary, William Lloyd George, setting out the grounds for reprieve. George denied the request. In a 2010 television interview, the grandson of the trial judge, Sir Cecil Havers, which is Justice Havers to us, actor Nigel Havers said his granddad had written to the Home Secretary recommending a reprieve as he regarded it as a crime personnel but received a curt refusal. Ruth de Miss Bickford, he had been chosen by Desmond Cousin, and asked to see Leon Simmons, the Clark solicitor Victor Mishcon, whose law firm had represented her, her in her divorce proceedings. Now before going to see Ruth, Simmons and Mishcon visited Bickford 
who urged them both to ask Ruth where she had obtained a gun. On the 12th of July 1955, the day before her execution, Miss Connor Simmons saw Ruth, who wanted to make her will. When they pressed Ruth for the full story, she asked them to promise not to use what she said to try to secure an approval, but Miss Connor refused. Ruth then said that she had been drinking with Cousin for most of the weekend and that Cousin had given her the gun and gave her some shooting practice. Cousin had also driven her to the murder scene and following a two hour interview, Miss Cron and Simmons went to the Home Office. The Permanent Secretary, Sir Frank Newsom, was summoned back to London and ordered the Head of CID to check the story. Lloyd George later said that the police were able to make considerable inquiries but they made no difference to his decision and in fact made Ruth guilt greater by showing the murder was premeditated. Lloyd George also said that the injury to the bystander was decisive in his decision. We cannot have people shooting off firearms in the street. Terrible accident, sorry. In a final letter to Blakely's parents, Ruth had wrote, I have always loved your son and I shall die still loving him. The Bishop of Stepney, Juice de Blanc, had visited Ruth before her execution. Before 9am on the day of execution, which was the 30th of July 1955, Hangman Albert Pierre Point and his assistant entered Ruth's prison cell and took her to the adjacent room to the execution room of where she was being hanged and there she was hanged. There were interviews with Albert Pierre Point online so if you want to go and read more about her execution then please do go and check that out on YouTube, Google, newspaper articles, I guess you can read about as well. Now this case was of course widespread controversy and it was even discussed by the cabinet in parliament and there was a petition that was sent to the home office that was signed by 50,000 people, not the public. Although the execution was mostly supported by the British public, it did help strengthen to support the abolition of death penalty, which halted in practice just 10 years later. Now the last known execution was in 1964. Between 1926 and 1954, 377 men and just 60 women were sentenced to death. Only 375 men and 7 women were executed. In early 1970s, Bigford had told Scotland Yard that Cousin had told him that Ruth had lied during the trial case. So this was, you know, quite a few years back now. And police did investigate but no action regarding Cousin was taken. So, even though he drove her to the murder scene, he gave her the gun, he helped her practice, he knew what was happening, yet he never got punished in the slightest. It all fell on Ruth's shoulders. And this is what there's so many things in this case that I feel like were not done properly. Like, why should her appearance make any any effect on how they judge her? But people do, did judge. People do judge. You know, yeah, she was a prostitute and she did kill him and she admitted that. But she was a, wasn't she a battered woman? Her first husband had abused her, David Blakely had abused her, he caused her to miscarry a baby, 
She's never been treated well by men in her life, from a, a young start. I do believe if it was happening today, there'd be a cause for diminished responsibility, provocation. That was just thrown out the window back then. See, nowadays there's a lot more awareness about things. I find it sad, like, that I think she just felt like this was the only way out. She loved David Blakely. She said so in, the, in that letter to Blakely's parents. But the fact that she was willing to give up her life and leave her two children behind. A boy was 10 years old and a little girl was three. Sadly, both children have since passed away. He had took his own life and I think she died of cancer. She was originally buried in the grounds of the Holloway prison, but then Neil got moved and she got moved to a nice little graveyard and she was named under Ruth Hornby but the headstone was smashed by her son not long before he took his own life. There was a lot going on in his head and I think a lot of that's probably got to do with what happened to his mum. This case has always kind of made me think about things and how things have changed over time. I feel kind of angry for Ruth. She wasn't given a fair trial. He, you know, he was an accomplice. He never received any punishment. I think she should have got jailed, definitely, because she killed a man. But I don't think she should have got executed. Not when the circumstances were the way they were. But I'd love to know what you think. Let me know in the comments below. Maybe one day I could do a live stream. Or maybe I could do that on my Patreon. So I will like the link to my Patreon below. And I can maybe do a live stream on there. But you'll need to sign up <laughs> to be able to see that. <laughs> so let me know what what if you'd like that to happen if you if you want to share your thoughts is there anything you know that i've not missed out did you know this ellis or did you know any of the men that she had dated and she was married to or did you know her children her family i would love to know so i hope you've enjoyed learning about ruth ellis and what happened to her it's been fun for me to share that even though it's not a nice case, I think it's a powerful case and it's changed laws for the better, in my opinion. <laughs> if you have enjoyed watching this video, then please do give me a big thumbs up. That would be brilliant. And don't forget to share so that more people can see this video and other videos that I've made. And don't forget to subscribe if you're new to my channel. Or if you've been watching me for a while but you haven't yet hit that subscribe button. Now's the time to do it. Or you can do it earlier. Whichever, I don't mind. Just, I hope you join the family. The word Dinky family. And don't forget to click on the notification bell. So you don't miss any future uploads. And I say I will add the Patreon link below. And the website where you can find more about world of dinky what else i do so yeah thank you for watching take care and i will see you all soon bye bye